baptism. This is the quietest church I've ever seen. I, I can't believe the babies aren't crying yet. I want to mention a little bit of advice it has nothing to do with my homily, but a few years ago I was serving with a very good priest friend of mine named Father Sam Lapico. And uh, Father Sam invited me to do a mass because a good friend of mine was converting to Catholicism. It was one of the scrutinies. I was his sponsor. And a baby started crying, and that mom just could not get the baby to be quiet. And this is what Father Sam said, because I used to be one of those people who sit in church and get annoyed when babies were crying. He said, let the baby cry, because if you walk into a church without a crying baby, that means that church has no future. Amen. Amen. So when you hear a baby squirming and crying, just be thankful that parent's trying to raise them up in the house of the Lord. And today... St. Bernardine's definitely has a future, amen? amen? It has a future, and I got to admit, eight months ago, I wasn't so sure it did. I haven't been here in a while, um, and it's my fault. And a lot of people have asked me to come, but it was such a horrible day for me that I've been trying to come back slowly and slowly and slowly. And then, uh, um, you know, I became an assisting deacon, whatever that is, uh, here because I let Father Miller take me to lunch and I let him pay for it. Um, that was five years ago and like I said there's a poor bishop in Washington that has no clue that I have another whole parish to deal with. So Father Rich on the other hand made the mistake of letting me take him to lunch and I paid for it and guess what he is our chaplain at St. Francis Academy. Amen. Yeah. And during that eight months, you know, someone said, oh, you know the new pastor at St. Bernie's? I said, oh, I know him really well. They said, well, how long have you known him? I said, oh, gosh, about three hours. <laughs> but it was an intense three hours. We, we met on that same morning, and since then we've become brothers and we've become friends, and I'm glad to be home. Amen? See, Jesus told parables so that people could better understand what he was trying to teach. He told parables so that something that is really impossible to understand, the kingdom of heaven, could be understood by being brought down to earth, put in real terms. So when I hear a parable, I'm supposed to put myself in the circumstance and eventually apply it to my life. Now in this parable, Determining which of the two sons did his father's will is not terribly difficult. Frankly, one's a hip hypocrite, and the other one's a sinner who repented. And on most days, I would submit that you and I, as Christians, are sinners that repent rather than hypocrites. Furthermore, we learn today that it's better to be a sinner that repents than it is to be a liar and a hypocrite. Amen? Now, there is one sticking point for me. One point that I have a real hard time getting past. You ready? One son said yes, but then did not go out into the vineyard and work. Now, I've done that a thousand times, amen? Even with my own parents, as a child, with my teachers, I said yes, but turned around and didn't do what I promised. I was ordained about six years ago, and the parish I was assigned to was also the parish of my high school principal. And he knew me in high school well, and it wasn't for all good reasons. And he knew that I have his job, which was a shock to him. He knew I was getting ordained, which was also a shock to him. And he knew I was getting assigned to his parish, but he kind of lost track of when all this would happen. So at my very first Mass, at that parish. I'd been a deacon for like three weeks by the time I got there. The whole mass goes by, he doesn't even notice me. It's a huge parish, so you know, there's always six or seven deacons there, most of them are seminarians, so I was just a face in the crowd. And after mass was over, he walks by me, and I'm dressed just like I am now, vested. I said, Mr. Moreland, aren't you going to say anything? And he looks me dead in the eye and said, dear God, they did it. <laughs> Again, that was just his loving way of saying, I'm really proud of you, Curtis. <laughs> so the son who said yes, but did not go 
do the work makes sense to me because several times throughout my life, that's exactly who I am. I told Jesus that I would obey his commands, and then I would turn around and fail to do it. Jesus said, forgive that person, deacon, and I said, okay, but then I would just hold on to my anger. He said to me, deacon, pray for your enemies, and I said, sure, I will. All the while, I was plotting my revenge, amen? Jesus says, go out and defend your faith. Defend what I have taught you and taught it as the truth. And I said, okay, but when the chance presented itself, I let an insult about my faith go unchallenged because I was cowardly. None of that is my sticking point, though. That's just me being a sinner, and I, I knew that. People are surprised. I'm like, look, I'm ordained, not canonized. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. The other son, I don't get it. He said, I will not, but changed his mind. Now, brothers and sisters, by that, I am completely perplexed because never, ever in my life have I ever looked at my mother, my father, an aunt, an uncle, a teacher, anyone older than me, and said, I will not. Honestly, Jesus lost me there. Such a maneuver in my family would have been unimaginable, and if I did try it, I sure as heck wouldn't be here preaching to talk about it. I will not? Are you serious? I mean, if I had been in the crowd, I'd say, well, Jesus, time out. How did the man make it past that point? That parable doesn't happen in my family, and I suspect it doesn't work in yours either, amen? And now that I'm in my mid-40s, it wouldn't work on my little cousins. It wouldn't work on my students. Heck, it really wouldn't work under, for anyone under the age of 25, as far as I'm concerned. Can I get an amen? amen? See, I had a student once at my last school. Never will forget this. The mother bought her in. She wasn't even in trouble with me. And was just upset about something the girl had done. And in the middle of telling me the story, the girl, I swear, looked at her mother and said, Mama, shut up. And I, I was in shock. So I remember saying, oh, no, 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 you can't do that in my office. You need to get the heck up out of here. And the girl left. And the mother looked at me and said, thank you. I don't know what to do with her. And I said, don't thank me. I wasn't talking to your daughter. I was talking to you. How are you going to let her talk to you that way and expect me to do something about it? Amen? Well, eventually she did come back to school. She graduated, and to prove that there is justice in the world, she's a teacher, amen? <laughs> now, I tell that story because it is kind of comical. It was painful at the time. But I find such behavior intolerable in my office, and I also know it's intolerable in my family. So doing this with God is beyond my comprehension. How do you tell God to his face, I will not? Well, here's the small insight, and I, I should be equally perplexed about the thought of lying to God as I am about the thought of openly disrespecting him. And what we learn in this parable is that he would rather be openly disrespected than lied to. If I find the thought of telling my parents, no, I will not, repug repugnant, then how much more so should it be with God? Yet that sin is not worse than saying yes with our mouths, but no with our hearts and minds. I should be ten times more repulsed by the fact that I so often tell God yes, tell you all yes publicly, but secretly say no. And here's another little insight. Not only can you be forgiven for failing to do the will of God, you can be forgiven for publicly disrespecting him in the first place. But if you do his will, it's easier for him to forgive than it is the other way around. Wow. Prostitutes and tax collectors. Look, my list of sins is long and distinguished, but those two aren't on it, amen? <laughs> but not only were they sinners, they were well-known public sinners. Their sins were public and everyone knew that outwardly they did nothing to honor God. Yet by turning to Christ 
they are entering the kingdom of heaven before someone who pretends to obey God publicly but privately says no. See, I, I wish I could be like that with my students. I just, I mean, you disrespect me, I go off, amen? Amen? amen. And the reason I go off at a student or a child disrespecting me is twofold. Truth is, it hurts my feelings. And when it doesn't hurt my feelings, it hurts my pride. Amen? Amen. Therefore, my reaction to that child is born out of pain as much as it may be born out of a desire to train them up in the way of Christ. And with God, when we disrespect him in the same way, it hurts too. But he doesn't react like this. That is why when the sinful say, no, I will not, and instead goes off and does what they're supposed to do anyway, he endures the pain and just patiently waits for us to obey. The earlier scripture, we are told that he's willing to take the pain of dying and dying on a cross, no less. And even then, on the cross, he was patient with us, and he will be patient with us until we do his will. Thank you, Jesus, because there is no other way a sinner like me would ever have a chance. And I do have a chance, amen? I do have a chance as long as I'm not a hypocrite. Amen? Amen. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring My heart is torn in pieces It's my offering Take me to the King Truth is I'm tired Options are few I'm trying to pray But where are you? I'm all churched out Hurt and abused I can't fail What's left to do? Truth is I'm weak No strength to fight No tears to cry Even if I try Refuses to die. Mm -hmm. One touch will change my life. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn in pieces. It's my offering Lay me at the throne Leave me there alone To gaze upon your glory And sing to you the song Please take me to the King 